everyone. Um, thanks for the intro. Um, on the same note, I guess like a really good quote from Diane Alves is my uh, camera is my passport and that's what I use to explore the world. So uh, when I studied in high school, I had an Asian family and they wanted me to do all the Asian things, study chemistry, physics, maths and all of that stuff. And I, um, I, I didn't want to do that. So they wanted me to get a real job. When I was in high school, I used to hang out with the art nerds. My best friend to this day is a painter and we went to high school together. And he used to sit in the library and look at the art books and I used to get really bored and I used to look at the photo books. And I, I found these photos by Don McCullen, James Narquay and a bunch of other journalists, Henry Cardia Bresson, who's a street photographer, and Diane Alves. And consequently, I really enjoyed going to the dark room in high school. I really, I felt most at home there and that was the one class which I had which wasn't chemistry, physics and maths. Uh, after I finished high school, I got a real job a real job, and uh, I stuck at it for a couple of years, and I, I friggin' hated it. It was, it was crap. And mm -hmm. once I got out of that job, I was like, well, photography has always been something I've loved, but everyone's always said, like, you'll never earn money out of it, you'll never, it, it's not a real job. Um, once I finished this real job, I was just like, screw it, I'm going for it. And I, I got out and took the plunge. So. Anyway, before I delve into photos, I, when I kind of took the plunge, I was looking at a lot of subculture at the time, a lot of punk rock, and in particular this one photographer called Glenn A. Freeman, um, who when he was a 15-year-old boy, he used to take a lot of photos of punk rockers. Um, if any of you are into that, he was the guy who took all the black flag photos, the early Beastie Boy photos, uh, Public Enemy. And he also took all the um, photos of all the pro skaters at the time as well. And he was like a 15-year-old kid with a camera. He released all of these photos in a book called, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say this, but Fuck You Heroes. And, uh, and that was basically all of these people who were kind of subverting society and, and creating progress. And I was kind of really inspired by that to, to document subcultures in Melbourne which kind of did the same thing. So... While I was still at uni, I, I jumped in and I had a couple of lecturers and I was like, I really want to look at, at the sex industry in Melbourne and in particular dominatrixes because it's not really a, a documented thing. And everyone told me it was impossible. All my lecturers were like, just don't even bother. And I kind of just took the plunge and I did it. So I'm going to sk skip through these kind of quickly. There's a lot of frames. So this is at uh, a place which was called the Correction Centre, just off St. David Street in Brunswick, uh, off Brunswick Street. It's kind of like right in the hub of Melbourne, like if you're from Sydney, it's kind of like the Redfern equivalent. And I really kind of, I, I, I know it seems quite foreign, but I really respect these people because they were putting their face to, to what they did. They kind of didn't really care what society had to say about them and, and they went through with it. Anyway, through, that series of photos, I submitted it for a bunch of photo competitions and my lecturers, uh, and, and they did quite well. And my lecturers kind of recognized that I was quite passionate. And um, one of them put my name forward to shoot film stills and it happened to be with quite a few well-known actors. That's Rachel Taylor on a small film we shot up in Mildura called Summer Coda. And consequently that led to more work. I kind of like to shoot behind the scenes a lot. and became really good friends with the crew, which got me more work on films. And this was a short film called Pam. The director of this film, um, that guy whose name escapes me, which is terrible, um, he's an actor in his own right. Ask me later. Anyway, um, he was on Balibo. He was one of the actors on a film, an Australian film called Balibo, which is about a bunch of journalists who were killed in East Timor in the Indonesian <laughs> invasion in 1975. He gave me a whole bunch of contacts in East Timor. I was like, you should just call these guys. And, uh, and a couple of weeks later, I was in East Timor. And his contacts turned out to be the presidential advisor, an ex-Australian army guy. So I was sitting at the president's house with him pouring the gin and tonics. This is Dr. Jose Ramosorda, which is kind of weird for like a 21, 22-year-old kid to be sitting with a, a Nobel Peace Prize laureate. Um, so I was really interested in East Timor, both as a country, because, you know, it's it's quite foreign and, and quite a developing nation and I really was interested in um, as a post-conflict nation the developing state of it 
one of the biggest issues in East Timor is maternal health and, and antenatal and neonatal health care. Um, so I wanted to investigate that. This is more scenic stuff. Sorry, before we get into that, um, while I was there, I volunteered shooting a lot of sports events. Um, this is an event called Tour de Timor, it's to promote tourism in the country. It's just a really picturesque place and it was a good way of highlighting it. This is um, Shinana Guzmao, who's the former Prime Minister. With his helmet on backwards. <laughs> no one told him. <laughs> so, this is... Uh, I went to a really small village called Asalao in the middle of nowhere in East Timor. I was the only person who spoke English, which meant that I had to learn the local language, Tetan, very quickly. In three days, it was nuts. I had this little phrase book and it was, it was insane. Um, this is a traditional midwife who's also been taught a bit of Western midwifery and contemporary midwifery, um, Marcelina. She walks about 15 k's a day, going to all of these homes and looking after either newborn babies or, or expectant mothers. Um, so I wanted to photograph a childbirth there because the maternal mortality rate in that country is huge and the, the troubles uh, which women face there are, are very real and quite deadly. As I was actually about to leave this village, we were literally waiting for our lift out, this woman was giving birth, so we ran down there and, and we went to photograph this childbirth. It was a breech birth, which means the baby's born upside down, legs first, which can be really life-threatening. Long story short, uh, over three terrifying hours, Marcelina, the midwife, oops, the wrong button. There you go, managed to save the baby's life. Um, it started breathing, and I was just talking to one of the doctors in Dili, and the baby's still alive today. So. Um, this is the Santa Cruz Cemetery, so for those who are old enough, this was the site of a fairly significant massacre, which led to the referendum, eventually led to the referendum, amongst other things, which led to the independence of East Timor in 99. So following from that, at the same time, my mum got diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. Um, so I was kind of balancing work, which was shooting for local newspapers, covering stuff in East Timor for foreign clients, um, and being a carer for my mum which meant that I was kind of grounded in Melbourne and, and consequently I ended up being here a lot more often. Um, and I was kind of documenting her journey through cancer, which was pretty tough. Um, it took a huge emotional toll. This is her going through chemo. after one of the sessions. It was really exhausting and I basically was taxing her from the hospital. She was relatively able-bodied until quite late. At the same time, I was photographing in Melbourne a bunch of East Timor East patients who were coming in through a beautiful Melbourne NGO called the East Timor Hearts Fund, which fly people from East Timor um, and perform heart surgery on them. So this was a mitral valve opening up your surgery. Um, which I covered and I pitched the story to the age. I didn't really think much of it at the time, I just wanted to document it for these people. And I just pitched the story and it managed to get the cover. Um, with my mum in the state she was in, this came out on Mother's Day, um, which was really, really sweet, about two months before she passed away. And consequently led to gigantic donations for the NGO and, and lifted their public profile a lot. So I documented my mum passing away, this is her last couple of days, and I ended up pulling out her oxygen after she passed away. That's her oxygen a couple of minutes. So for me, photography is just a way of life. I take my camera absolutely everywhere. I go, it's on the floor over there at the moment. Um, this was my way of getting through her death, was basically photographing everything <coughs> and telling her story. Oops. After she passed away, I was just kind of lost of what to do. I was shooting in Melbourne. I was kind of working out where to go from here. It was huge. I'm an only child, um, 
and my mum's the only one who's around. So I was kind of pretty shell shocked. I was shooting in Melbourne, I was covering asylum seeker rallies, I was covering everything I could just to basically not fall into a rut. And it was about that period, my mentor, my really good friend, Lewis is who he was a shooter for the age, but he used to work for Reuters and AP and a bunch of other wire agencies around the world. It was like, you know what, you should go to Thailand right now. Things are looking interesting there. So I did. I just, about three days later, I bought my airfare and I was in Thailand. Um, it was about that time that the Yellow Shirts, or the PDRC as they were known at the time, uh, started up protesting in, in Bangkok. Um, so on the 13th of January, 12th, 13th of January last year, the Bangkok shutdown started and I was there covering. Um, it was a really crazy opportunity I had to meet all of these foreign photojournalists. Um, so as I was saying before, when I was in high school, Jim Nakway, James Nakway was a guy whose name comes up. If you know anything about photojournalism or this kind of thing. There's a documentary I think called War Photography which was released and I watched it when I was like 17 years old. And uh, he was there covering. So um, I got to meet like basically my hero. And I moved in with a lady called Paula Bronstein who is a two-time runner-up for the Pulitzer Prize. She's covered Afghanistan for the last 10 years. I called her last night, she's in Kabul as we speak. Um, Adam Ferguson, another Australian war photographer who's, who's insane and you should look all of these guys work up there. Absolutely amazing journalists. Anyway, I was working alongside them and it was, it was kind of mind blowing. We uh, actually ended up sharing heaps of information because this is like one of those events where stuff's going on all around the city, you don't know where anything is and you're all just messing, messaging each other frantically trying to work out where to be at what time. Um, on this particular day, this was before the elections, um, the PDRC had shut down one of the buildings which they kept the ballot papers at in order to prevent them from being distributed so the elections can go ahead. These guys who were white shirts, also red shirts, um, pro-democracy protesters is I think how the media described them, were understandably quite pissed and marching up the road to confront them. These guys are the yellow shirts of the PDRC. The reason they're wearing jackets is because they've actually got firearms underneath them. Um, and the tensions were just kind of escalating all throughout the day. At about two or three o'clock, um, the first gunshots kind of went out. There was a bit of a firefight. So there was a guy with an assault rifle in a bag. The red shirts had a couple of handguns and we were kind of caught up in the fire. So these are the yellow shirts taking cover. So the top photo is my pick, well they're both my picks, but the top photo is the guy with the assault rifle in the bag and he was literally like a meter away from me at that stage. And it was kind of crazy because on the other side everyone's trying to kill him, which meant all the bullets were flying towards me, <laughs> which is kind of not ideal. Um, anyway, in their own Thai way, they, they kind of merchandise everything and they made this guy a hero. Underneath it is the toy which you could buy like a week later. <laughs> the guy with the rifle and the bag. Um, and they were marketing him as a hero who was defending the unarmed yellow shirt protesters with an assault rifle. Um, this is, uh, at the same time, I was kind of, I didn't want to just cover politics in Thailand. I also wanted to have a look at different elements. So uh, this is at Wat Bang Phra, which is a temple just north of Bangkok. Every year they have a tattoo festival. It's actually last week, um, where they have sacred tattoos on their body, which they believe, well, it's, it's kind of like an animist culture, which has been incorporated into Buddhism. And they believe that they're possessed on this particular day by their spirit animal. And this guy is just being possessed by a spirit animal and is running towards, there's a stage at the end of this massive crown. It's kind of hard to describe. It's like a car park with hundreds of people sitting there. And then occasionally someone will be possessed and run towards the stage where they'll be blessed by the abbot and you know there's always lions and tigers and and hawks and some really bizarre looking things which we were trying to work out what they were but we couldn't anyway this guy's being subdued by them all this guy at the front was also possessed and this is when the abbot's spraying water down that's what the mist is in the background it's the same day
After that, I went to uh, Yangon, which is an old world speak, Rangoon in Burma or Myanmar. And we, I've been a couple of times. <laughs> we went to cover the Water Festival, which is kind of a Buddhist New Year in Theravada Buddhist countries, which is like Burma, Cambodia, Thailand. Um, and they save up a whole bunch of water in, in the areas which are close to water. Or if you're close to water, they rip out fire hoses and pump it out and just squirt water at each other. And it's really beautiful. Um, anyway, this is a guy sleeping. I just thought it was a nice mirror. So this is the water festival itself. This is right out the front of Yangon or Rangoon Town Hall and Sule Pagoda. Sule is um, really famous as being the epicenter of a lot of the protests there. The, um, the Saffron Revolution, uh, the 98, uh, 1988 killings, the massacres. Um, but I, I kind of really like this moment. You have the military in the bottom left corner. That's a, the balloon thing is uh, advertising for Arugu, which is a new network which has just opened up in the country, um, which kind of speaks to Burma's um, democratization, commercialism. They just had a KFC built there a couple of months ago. Um, but there's all this stuff going on there now. Anyway. About the same time the coup happened in Thailand, the most recent coup happened in Thailand. So this is bits from the coup. This is five o'clock in the morning, the day after it broke, the uh, monks were out collecting arms, and this is right next to the Yellow Shirt camp, the PDRC camp. At the same time, there were anti-coup protesters. Um, the coup probably wasn't popular amongst the Thai population. Um, it was a military-run coup. It was largely bloodless. Anyway, these are, these are, at the time, identifying with white shirts protesting against the coup in the military. This is at, if any of you have been to Bangkok, this is MBK, Siam. So the army were basically flushing out all the anti coup protesters and starting on their crackdown. And this still kind of happens now. Well, not to this extent, but there's, uh, they shut down the Human Rights Watch webpage a couple of months ago. That's James Mark Freda. He's like my zero. I kind of wet my pants when I made him. <laughs> Um, anti coup protesters in the army. Um, the anti coup protesters, I think, at this stage were throwing bottles at us. So these guys had shields, I, I kind of didn't. <laughs> um, they got quite tense at times. And most of the soldiers, just, soldiers are just um, they're conscripted. So they're just these kids who are getting yelled at by these people. They don't really have a choice of whether they're there or not. This guy was pretty, pretty terrified. Um, so Jackie Hocking, who's the person who put my name up to come to this thing, um, I think she's spoken here before, maybe? No? Well, she knows people here. Yeah. Anyway, she, um, she's a videographer. She's an amazing chick, and she got me on board with this, and she also got me on board with this job in PNG. Um, we were on a, that was a medical ship going through the Gulf region, um, photographing the work they did. So, actually I'll go back to that last one. So this is a nurse in Karavaki village, I believe. And this village was crazy. There was just like, the local sawmill, they started um, they used to give out all the sawdust to the villagers, and the villagers used to use that to pack down on the road. On the road, and um, that would stop the moisture from setting in. And they changed the sawmill operator, and the sawmill operator wouldn't give the sawdust out for free, and the villagers couldn't afford to buy it. So this guy had like just packs and packs of sawdust, and the village just ended up getting muddy and swampy. So if you have a look at this nurse and have a look at her boots, that's the only way to get around the village. Um, it's just like ankle deep mud, which is like really, really great for dinging and stuff. So just giving implant on implants and teaching the local nurses how to give implant on implants. I think I've 
is not it? It's the TV board. Oh, PNG has crazy amounts of TV. It's, it's kind of the epicenter of TV, which is really awful, I think. Um, 15,000 people get diagnosed each year, of which 4,000 die. Um, and it's treatable, and it's just from all of Australia. This is in Myanmar. Um, so to the west of Myanmar, there's a small city called Sitwe. And in 2012, the Rakhine State, which is where Sitwe sits, um, which is a predominantly Buddhist country, had intercommunal violence with the Rohingya minority. Um, Consequently, they burnt down a lot of the Rohingya, well, all the Rohingya houses, and put them into these camps, which um, have been described as concentration camps. Um, the UN has described these people as the most uh, persecuted people in the world. The BBC has described them as the least wanted. Um, this is inside one of the camps, so we had to get fixed to this, and we kind of got our way in. Um, it's right on the ocean, so there's a lot of fishing boats in there, and a lot of those fishing boats are actually used to escape to Malaysia. If they don't make it to Malaysia, if they get caught up in southern Thailand, they get taken into these crazy camps where they torture them and do sorts of awful things to extort them for money. This gentleman had TB as well. This is inside the camps. Um, it's been described as a slow genocide because these people are deprived of medical aid, food. Um, they're, they're kept in for their own protection to stop them from being targeted by the uh, Buddhists outside, but they don't really have an option to leave. So the Rohingya are a uh, Muslim minority group. Um, in Sitwe city itself, there's a mosque from the 9th century which was burnt down amongst all of this. It's like a 1,400-year-old 1, year old mosque. Um, this is inside the makeshift mosque which they made out of bamboo inside the camp. This is down at the docks, these are the boats which they fish and escape on. And that's what I mean by it looks like a concentration camp, it's been described as one. There are NGOs which do work inside the camps and the government have kind of given them a bit of access, but uh, Big ones like MSF got kicked out in Feb last year. They've been allowed back in, but yeah, it's, it's quite a contentious issue. So this is Hong Kong. The students had been gassed the night before, and again, it was a really interesting learning experience. All the world's journalists are there. So if you ever want to network as a photographer, just wait for a coup. <laughs> um, or popular protest, especially in Hong Kong, because it's so expensive. So. All of these publications sent all their best photojournalists in because you know, if you're going to supply someone in, it might as well be the best. Um, yeah, so I got to kind of work around with these guys again. This is the John Lennon wall, opposite the John Lennon wall. You can see why it's called that. So, um, so we were working for like 20 hours a day, just going back to our hotels, dumping our memory cards and just kind of napping and waking up on your keyboard and going out and doing it again. It was really humid at this time, quite hot. So a lot of the wire agencies like Getty and Waiters and AP had three photographers working and they just kind of take shifts. Um, the freelancers, and there was, you know, quite a fair amount of us. We were just kind of punching it through. So the cops apparently. <laughs> And the protesters. <laughs> and that's the Lenin wall. That made it all over the news. Um, so this was in Mong Kok, which my housemate got arrested in, and she made it all over the news as well. Um, Mong Kok's an area known for its gangsters, its triads, and it was also where one of the student protest sites were. There was lots of protest sites. This is one of the main ones. This, the police kind of couldn't use heavy-handed force again. Um, after the gassing incident, they gave Beijing a really bad rap. So, you know, a lot of triads were out there and they weren't really happy with the students. The cops were trying to create a barrier so the students could leave peacefully without the triads harassing them because the triads at that stage were ripping down tents and 
and uh, being not particularly nice. And as this unit was leaving, he slipped from the bird, just did that, and all the triads ran in and beat the crap out of him. It's like a 15 year old boy, it was awful. But it was really admirable to see them standing up for their rights, the students. It was led by a 17 year old boy called Joshua Wong. He, you know, in Paris, Beijing internationally. This is Australia Day. This is in um, Melbourne. So when I got back, um, after my mum passed away, I bought a house in Melbourne and I've just been working on it since. And I kind of fly between Asia and here. Um, so I do jobs around. I guess I wanted to add these slides in just to show that there's stories everywhere and you can make beautiful images anywhere in the world. There's always someone who has an amazing story, like all of you beautiful people here. Um, this is Australia Day, I just had to shoot it for the council, which was, I really like this photo. It's been like Harry Potter. And that was like two days ago for the local paper. Um, I guess this is about just, when I was at uni, I had this lecturer who I really didn't like. Um, but one thing which he said to me was, if you want to take the shot and there's a river in the way or whatever, just jump in the river and take the shot. And, and I, I was at the bottom of a swimming pool for this. So yeah, I thought I'd finish up on that. It's uh, it's just about taking the taking the risk, going in there and giving it all. Cool. <laughs>